We're streaming live on Facebook. Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining us uh, this morning or the afternoon or the evening in the Why Young Living, uh, Why You and Why Now Facebook group, where we bring a lot of leading edge ideas about why you and I need to be building our empires, empires here in Young Living. I had the great opportunity last January at the um, New Year kickoff to meet Dr. Bartlett and hear his story. And I just loved so much his energy, his enthusiasm, his sense of humor, his authenticity, that I caught him outside the bathroom and said, hey, my name's Richard and I wanna interview you. <laughs> Yeah, I'm so glad you waited till we were outside. Thanks. <laughs> and much to my surprise, a little bit of surprise, but um, he said, absolutely. Of course, we're busy and it took a while to get this done. But Mark, thank you so much for joining me for this live. I got a lot of questions for you, not about science, um, but about you and what you bring to the party and what we all have the opportunity to do here in Young Living. So thank you for taking some time. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. I noticed, um, you know, before we went live, I noticed, well, you're at the office. And I, I sort of commented about that because I saw maybe on your Facebook page that when you work from home, you like to take a break and go outside and feed the chickens. So I got a little <laughs> view of your house. Um, <laughs> but you made a comment about being in the office, which I thought everybody ought to hear. So. Why are you in the office and what are you doing in the office? And I like that comment about a full contact sport. Yeah, um, I think I said uh, that I believe that innovation is a contact sport, right? And um, maybe it's a little bit of a stereotype that scientists get, right? Is that ah, they just like to work on their own. They don't work well with others. Just leave them alone in their room with their test tubes or their petri dishes. But actually, uh, every scientist that I know loves to get feedback from other scientists. Maybe we're just insecure or something, but we uh, we work together. Um, you know, uh, more brains, better ideas, and uh, there's just a synergism that happens. And we have an amazing team here at Young Living. I'm used to just being able to pop in to the chemistry lab and and talk to people, or if I have an idea, sort of run over to the development team and say, have you thought about this or mixing X with Y? And I love having the oils lab just right here where I can go in and talk to Rex and others who are, or HK. And, uh, you know, this is, uh, and sometimes they're organized meetings, of course, right? We have uh, organized scheduled meetings, the innovation pod where we just free, free form ideas. Uh, maybe we say, hey, uh, let's uh, go do a literature search on this or that, but, you know, that's not very easy to do when you're just working from home. I just love being able to sort of have people right at our fingertips here. Yeah, I love that. I'm curious, other people might be too. What are you diffusing back there? Ah, that is the new Valor. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> yeah, is there a story? You've got a beautiful aroma. Yep. And when you say new... Um, is that the new old Valor or what's the story with that? Uh, yeah, the new old one. So uh, after we um, obtained approval again to use the rosewood from Brazil. So this has got the real rosewood in there, right? And it just, you can tell the difference. It's really quite, I think that uh, Gary and the team did an amazing job when, when uh, we could no longer use the rosewood in combining some oils that smelled a lot like it. It was really good and it satisfied Gary and the team and and us, but being able to get this back, super excited. Just uh, really amazing what a added dimension the, the rosewood gives to it. And what for, for those of us maybe like me that are not, uh, don't have a PhD in oils, what does the new Valor do for us? What is its, what are its unique properties of shifting the physiology of a human being? You know, I don't, yeah, I, I'm glad you brought that up because I don't have a PhD in oils. <laughs> My PhD is in immunology and cell biology. Right. And uh, and before that, I was a planty. So um, I've always been fascinated in natural products chemistry, how plants are able to capture the energy from the sun and then uh, create all of these molecules. And it starts with um, 
I know I told you I wouldn't go into science in depth, but I just love it. And this is what fascinated me. When I learned um, how plants harness the energy of the sun and make sugar molecules, right? They, they have this enzyme called Rubisco, ribulose, um, ribulose phosphate, bis, uh, well, I won't go into that, but they have this enzyme that captures CO2 from the air with the power of the sun and combine it to a five carbon sugar and then from there, create all the molecules of nature. To me, that's just fascinating. That's what I did my master's in. <clears throat> and so that's why I've always had a, an interest in not only how plants make these things, but how they interact with humans. And uh, so you asked the question, well, how does this work? Um, that's certainly a whole new area for me. I love, I, I have loved this journey. You know, Richard, that I worked for a long time uh, in sort of the natural products arena with a supplement company, mostly focusing on nutrition. Um, did there some genetics and other things before that working for the National Cancer Institute. And there again, still focusing on natural plant products. So my interest in plants led me, sort of gave a flavor to everything that I did in biology, meaning uh, not the drug route, but actually what did mother nature make and how does that impact us? I know that Gary created this oil because of its impact on the psyche, right? Gary was going through something really hard at the time. I think he was having to deal with some regulatory authorities and he needed to feel um, valor, to feel courage and to feel a calmness. And uh, he had an amazing intuition. I didn't know him personally, but just from all of the reading that I've done, he had an amazing intuition about things. He could do things intuitively and with the education that he had self-taught that um, others just couldn't do naturally. And, uh, you know, maybe a team of PhDs might've figured it out. Um, what I'm really interested in is, okay, if, if aromas do have an impact on us, how does that work? So super excited to join Young Living and especially excited to start to do some work in the olfactory receptor and how that olfactory receptor um, decodes these uh, essential oils or these volatile substances that nature provides, decodes them and puts them together and sends them straight to the part of the brain, the amygdala, that is involved with emotion and memory and all of those things. And there's some really good science that's emerging in this area right now. And uh, rest assured, we are working on some of those things at Young Living, and, uh, and we're going to reveal everything as fast as we can learn it. So it seems seems like from watching some of your interviews, Mark, that you're learning a lot about Gary through Jacob. Is that true? Yes, having conversations with Jacob, but we also have two really good historians here at Young Living. Well, you know, Jacob and Mary have all of that institutional knowledge, but we have Karen Boren, who has been with the company for years and years, and in fact was my wife's best friend when my wife worked with Young Living 20 years ago. Um, wow. And then we've got John Wetton as well, right, who between those two have captured and digitized uh, all of Gary's speeches and his writings. And Karen just feeds that stuff to me. So I, even this morning she read, uh, she sent me some material that Gary had written about flavonoids and essential oils and the citrus oils and things and comparing those to pycnogenol. And uh, so, yeah, I've, uh, I've been picking Gary's brain since I've been here quite a lot. You have a really interesting, especially for this role, a really interesting and authentic uh, background growing up in Australia. Could you tell us a little bit about what life was like for you as a kid and how maybe you came to become fascinated with photosynthesis and the plants and a, a planty, as you call it? Yeah. Um, you know, growing up in the city, I think, is very different to growing up in the country. And uh, so I didn't grow up in the city so much. I did move to Sydney later on, uh, you know, before I was 10, but still enough of the impact was made. I lived in the country. My parents and grandparents had a sheep farm and apple orchards. And uh, <clears throat> so I was uh, obviously exposed to these aromas like the lanolin, from, you know, the sheep wool fat and the, the smell of the apples in the apple shed when we were sorting them and cleaning them and boxing them and, and the other thing that makes Australian outback a very visceral experience is that you have these gum trees that also have their aroma, right? I used to love to squish the, uh, the eucalyptus tree leaves. 
Um, and you've got all sorts of poisonous and nasty things there too. So you get uh, the combination of all of those things gave me a very healthy respect for nature um, and, you know, enjoy the things that it has to offer. I mean, even the flowers in Australia are really weird looking, right? The banksias and the kangaroo paws. And um, so you can't help but sort of develop this uh, relationship, this love of nature. Um, when I moved to the city, um, you know, I realized, wow, all of these things are, are quite lacking, even though even in Australia, the cities are kind of interesting. But really, that stuck with me. And it didn't hurt that my father was an uh, inorganic chemist. So he was an a industrial chemist. And uh, so he did a lot of work there. And uh, I would ask him a question and he would never answer the question. He would always ask another question to help me figure it out. So I guess all of those things combined uh, sort of gave me, I think, a really good solid background to want to be a scientist. So all my friends in Australia, you know, it's rugby season now. Everyone's excited about the All Blacks who just lost to France. And uh, big surprise there. Um, so th all my friends are trading football cards and cricket cards. And uh, I just felt like an outsider because I was interested in learning how they discovered penicillin and, uh, you know, Madame Curie and what she discovered about things that you can't even see that are impacting us. So, yeah, I guess uh, I was a bit of a nerd and a bookworm right from the start. And I'm glad so, I ended up here. <laughs> that Well, I'm curious about that journey, too. So you ended up at the National Cancer Institute, did some really extraordinary research there. And then I, I don't know if everybody knows this, but I picked up on it because I'm a network marketing kind of um, a historian, but you spent a lot of years with Pharmanex, which is a division of New Skin, right. which is the third largest network marketing company in the world. Can you connect the dots there? How did you get from Australia to Provo to New Skin, the network marketing company? Yeah. Um... You know, throughout my career in science, you know, I started uh, um, even before I did my PhD, I was start, I was working in a cancer um, lab in Australia, in the Capital Territory there in Canberra. And uh, actually, the work that I was doing was um, was in the area of free radical biology. So I was um, taking blood from donors every day and making preparations of the blood, uh, low density lipoprotein particles. And I was studying the impact of free radicals on that and the testing antioxidants. So things like vitamin E. And uh, at the time, um, I remember my dad coming to me uh, and saying, hey, son, I just got diagnosed with my doctor with kind of high cholesterol and I've been healthy all my life. So I'm a bit worried about this. What should I do? And the doctors have prescribed this drug. And I said, oh, well, yeah, let me look at those numbers. Yeah, I wouldn't worry too much, Dad. Did you know that? Uh, and at the time, all the science was telling us that, uh, and there were hundreds of papers in this area. I mean, it's mind boggling how many papers came out every day, scientific discoveries. And they all pointed to this concept that, um, that cholesterol in and of itself isn't a bad thing in your blood. But if it's oxidized, then it's recognized by the blood vessel wall. So not oxidized, if that cholesterol in, in the form of these LDL particles or whatever is just going through the blood circulation, um, the blood vessel wall doesn't even notice it. But as soon as it's oxidized, then the blood vessel wall notices it and it's attracted to the blood vessel wall and it causes a kind of a lesion and then it causes a sort of a, a, a inflammation and that leads to cardiovascular disease. So the basic outcome is, well, then you should make sure that that particle is not oxidized. Well, how do you do that? Well, that's why all the studies were suggesting if you have a diet rich in vegetables and fruits that are full of antioxidants like vitamin E and the flavonoids and the polyphenols and all these things, then it will protect those LDL particles from being oxidized and you won't really uh, you know, suffer from cardiovascular issues. So I said that to my dad and he said, well, my doctor didn't tell me that. And that's when I had this epiphany that there's a ton of research going on in the world and scientists know a lot of this stuff, but how do you translate that to people? How does someone like my dad find this out? So I was working at the National Cancer Institute and I was looking at sort of natural inhibitors of cancer metastasis and inflammation. 
And uh, New Skin heard about me and Pharmanex, and they called me up and they said, hey, would you work with us? And I thought, well, why would I want to work with you? I'm like, I'm doing research that I think really matters here. And you're asking me to go make soap for you or toothpaste or something. And, uh, and they said, no, no, that's not what we're doing. You know, come and look at what we're doing. And so I, I did. I sort of took some time out and I came to Provo, Utah. And I realized that they were doing some really good faith efforts in this area of nutrition. So they were looking at phytochemicals from nature. So not just vitamins and minerals, but these things that I'm talking about, the polyphenols and the, the carotenoids and, and all of these things that nature provides that actually are good for you and that have a biological effect. And the second thing that I realized when I talked to Nuskin was, oh, they have this like direct selling model. Well, then who sells your product? Well, it's thousands, hundreds of thousands of these, um, what they call distributors, who are really uh, not just enamored, enamored, but passionate about health. And they are sponges for science and information. And these guys learn the science and they go and share it with their network of friends. And something clicked and I just said, wow. So, you know, rather than one scientist who has a dad with a question, maybe I can leverage all of that knowledge through this network marketing uh, magic. And uh, so I actually left the National Cancer Institute and my mother was really upset. She's like, I was so proud of you, son. I thought you were gonna cure cancer. And now you've gone left to make soap with some direct selling company, you know, like <laughs> um, it took a little while to explain. <laughs> How long, had you ever heard of network marketing before New Skin? I, I had actually, um, I, um, believe it or not, I'm a fairly outgoing person. And so actually to get through college, I joined a network marketing company. Um, I did Amway for a little while. And then I joined this uh, perfume imposter company um, called La Rave. And uh, I actually sold some product while I was doing my PhD and my undergraduate to earn a bit of money. And I recognized that it was a good model. And in fact, it's interesting because even though the stuff I was working with was synthetic at the time, um, you know, the the impact that aroma has on humans. Uh, actually, I learned a little bit of that way back in my college days uh, when I looked at the impact of perfume. So yeah, I, I knew about it, but I had never really clicked. It never really clicked with me how to connect my passion for what nature has to offer and, and health and uh, living life to its fullest. I hadn't connected that with the ability to get that message out there to be a force for good and improve people's lives. Well, you must have done a good job there because, you know, it's two and a half billion dollar company. How long were you with New Skin? 27 years. And wow. they, uh, yeah, they doubled several times while I was there. We were onto something good, but, you know, all good things must come to an end. I actually kind of feel like, uh, well, we can talk about it, but I love where I am right now. It's a whole different approach. Yeah, well, I'm interested in that. Uh, you know, New Skin's a totally different company. I'm not edifying or endorsing them but you know they've done a good job it's yeah. like stating that you were there for 27 years because um that says a lot what what did you experience in those 27 years about the network marketing model that surprised you or inspired you yeah what i liked about it is it kept me humble uh in that's one there's a lot of things that i loved about it one was it keeps me humble First of all, you know, when you're uh, a PhD and you're working with other PhDs, you tend to get a little, I think it's just normal to get a little bit, um, maybe, I don't know if elitist is the right word, but you just kind of feel like, well, we're the ones that know the science and I don't know that others do, right? And I always wanted to share that. So maybe I'm a little bit different in that regard. I like to be a teacher and I like to share science in a manner that everyone can understand. So I don't like to hide behind big words or, or difficult to understand concepts. I believe everyone can appreciate it. But what I learned was um, how valuable the relationship is between the product developer, the innovator, and the customer, the person that is actually using the products. And I don't see that happening with Procter & Gamble or with Pfizer, any of these, you know, with Merck, Sharp & Dove. I see it happening in direct selling companies. I just loved the opportunity that I had to interact with people like you, Richard, and other direct sellers who are amazing people. Most of them have incredible stories. They're super smart and they do understand a great level of 
science uh, in whether it's personal care science or nutrition health you kind of have to because you've got to be um you, you've just got to be an amazing person you've got to have a thick skin you've got to be dynamic you've got to be able to explain in marketing terms scientific principles uh, and you get amazing feedback so uh, to me it was a a product developer and innovators dream to be able to work directly with really smart customers that are selling the product. It's a, it's a fantastic relationship that um, it just short circuits that whole thing that I don't think other companies can do. Yeah. And do I understand it correctly that you were then retired from new skin or about to retire? And so could you tell us the story? Yeah. Yeah. I think get I had... for, for young <laughs> And what did you think when you first saw Young Living? Okay. Well, I, yeah, you're right. I had decided that I'm just going to keep doing this till it's not fun anymore. And, you know, dynamics change in companies. And uh, despite the fact that I had an amazing team and we'd accomplished great things, I, I felt a kind of a dynamic change that wasn't sort of gelling with my own personality anymore. So I thought, ah, it's time to, it's time to leave. And I'd always also I've been motivated by the idea of writing a book about some of my adventures with science and health and longevity. And, and so I thought, oh, I've got plenty of fodder here to write a book. And so I was, so I did that. I just said goodbye and I'm going to go do this other thing. And uh, um, I wasn't long sort of into that, you know, not even a month. And the phone rang and it was this guy named Prasad who had a friend named Prasad who heard about me. And, um, and I was like, so Crystal, it's it's Young Living on the phone. Like you used to work for them, right? Should I go to lunch with these guys or give it a miss? And she said, well, you better be polite. I mean, I really like those guys at Young Living. And uh, so I said, okay, I'll go have lunch with them. And, uh, but quite truthfully, um, I, what was my initial contact with Young Living? My wife worked for them for Young Living 20 years ago. She helped, uh, you know, when Ningxia Red was being developed she actually was doing some of the research. She's a food scientist and, and was doing a scientific writer and worked with uh, Marco. Uh, Marco, I guess he was called Mark Schroeder then, um, and with Bill Poppin and some of these other people and worked with uh, Karen Boren um, and knew Gary and Mary. And she just would always come home happy and laughing and smelling a little weird. Um, and she just loved her experience there. And in fact, uh, she became pregnant with our first son and he was born to be a beautiful baby and super smart. And, and I always wondered if it was because she was so happy when she was working with Young Living and loved that environment and was also sort of inhaling all of these strange oils. Um, and, you know, our son is 20 now and just a, a brilliant human being. Um, and so, you know, I couldn't help but be um, have a soft spot for Young Living. But when it came to the oils and the kind of claims that were being made, I was very skeptical. Like, so I certainly understand vitamins and minerals and antioxidants and phytochemicals, right? That's sort of where, I, where my wheelhouse was. And then I was like, what is this essential oils part? Uh, but I did, um, you know, I came and visited the company uh, while everyone was out, saw our amazing labs, read the bios of the scientists that are working here, uh, read about Gary and, and read about oils. And it was just a revelation to me. Um, I've been here for just over a year now that there's this whole new area. And let me just say, um, I'm just going to gloss over this a little bit. But for me, health and wellness is super important. And there's so much that we could do in terms of our lifestyle, there are a couple of things that were going on at Young Living that aren't going on in other places as far as I can tell, certainly not as well. One, a recognition of the huge difference between natural and synthetic. And uh, while there's some recognition of that, I think that Young Living is really sort of interested in that. And, and that is very connected to low-tox lifestyle and healthy homes. And the other thing is spiritual. Um, you know, this it, it is important to be healthy. But your physical wellness is only a very small part of your experience while you're here on this planet and this earth, right? Your relationships with others, your relationships with God, if you have uh, that belief, um, you know, the way that you treat others, um, your relationship with yourself, this whole spirit part um, and memory and emotion and how you perceive the world, that's not something that 
you really deal with in the pharmaceutical industry, certainly even in the nutrition industry. It's good to be healthy. It's a good foundation. But I loved the thought that these oils, you know, just like we discussed Valor, it's so much more than just a nutraceutical. It's something that can impact, um, you know, uh, something that's a lot deeper than that. So, you know, I still want to work out mechanisms. That I'm still not sort of a, a you know, a pseudoscientist. But there's real science to be uh, dug up in this area. I think there's so much. Uh, we're just scratching the surface of the power of this essential component of plants. So I'm just really wrapped right now, very passionate about this. So a year's not very much time, but I imagine, uh, and I'm not asking you to future things that are not open for discussion yet, but couldn't you like share what is your vision for the next 10 years of Young Living when it comes to product development? Like, where do you see us being a decade from now in terms of the kind of formulas um, that we're, we're all getting to use in our homes and tell our friends about? What's the impact you see you having there? Yeah, um, I feel, you know, just like I shared with you the story of my father coming to me and me realizing that there was a, that we needed a better conduit for the science and the information, because that information leads to power, right? The, the knowledge that you have, like that, that my father gained, right? That, well, the best thing I can do is not necessarily take a drug that might, might may or may not make a difference and may have side effects, actually is to change my lifestyle and Thanks, son. You've given me information that helps me to know what direction I should go in a natural way to be more healthy, right? And to live a good life. And he's he's 80 something now and still healthy. And um, I uh, I feel like education is a huge component of what we're doing at Young Living. So I would love to see us kind of um, do the research or find the research and be better at communicating that research. You know, for example, I found a paper just the other day. Um, this one right here, um, overnight olfactory enrichment that, uh, so just using an odorant diffuser improves memory and modifies, uh, certain sort of parts of the brain structure that they're calling the uncinate fasc fasciculus. I'm not a neuroscientist. So, um, I think that's, this is an amazing little study in this study. They got some older individuals they're in their sixties to 80. And they, um, they actually gave them this test. It's this crazy test that's called the, um, um, the auditory verbal learning test or the revolt, right? And in this, they give you, the, the, the doctor reads out a list of 15 words and, uh, you know, that are unrelated. So I'll read some of them to you, like drum, curtain, bell, coffee, right? Read out that list of words and then say, hey, Richard, uh, now I want you to recite back to me the words. It doesn't have to be in the same order, but just read that as many of those 15 as you can remember. And then uh, he'll ask you to do it again. And then after a while, I'll give you a new list and then say, OK, now without me reading that list again, tell me as many words as you can remember on the 15 word list. And it's not an easy test. It's kind of a tough test, especially for an older person to do. Um, but with a control group, and then with the active group, they basically gave them a few different um, essential oils and a diffuser and said, diffuse this every night before you go to bed for a couple of hours. And we're going to test you again in six months. And in six months, um, they had statistically improved uh, memory uh, compared to the placebo. And they also could physically see changes in the brain that showed that the brain was cooperating better across the two hemispheres. To me, that's fascinating. And yeah. there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of soup there for more research, and there's a lot of stuff that we can take advantage of at Young Living there. So uh, you know, will that help us to formulate products, or will it help us to tell our, our story better? Is there research that we can do that makes oils more accessible? You know, the problem I think maybe one of the problems that we face is that there's a lot of skepticism. People think that we're just sort of uh, hocus pocus, uh, woo woos, but but we're not. There's real science there. And I would love in the next few years, you know, I've got a sort of a goal that in the next few years, we really elevate the status of young living to that's not woo woo. Look at all the cool science that's coming of that. And, uh, and the products that we launch, not just oils, but maybe uh, 
take more advantage of the science that we have in terms of what the benefits of those essential parts of the plant have uh, in consumable nutritional health. So uh, that's kind of where I see it. I know there's a very broad strokes, but I think there's a lot of good stuff to be had there. Beautiful. And Kimmy and I found that same study um, just a month ago and her, her dad was here. Her dad's in his mid eighties and he was just recently diagnosed with early stage Alzheimer's. And as a result, you know, he's involved in a, in a nutritional program, kind of a keto program to, for brain health that he's spending thousands of dollars on and he's still scared right yeah. he's scared yeah. about like what does the future bring and when we showed him this study and said hey here's a diffuser here's a half a dozen oils you can start to it gave him great hope right hope and, yeah. and virtually nothing for him to hang on to some memory for a few more years so right yeah and you know it doesn't have to be that complicated either i look at that and i go well What's the title of the study? Uh, olfactory enrichment. You know, when you think about how you raise your kids um, or even your pets, you give them a stimulatory, sort of a stimulatory environment. You give them more toys to play with, books to read, words to learn, uh, social interactions. All of that is environmental enrichment. And what we're learning then is a natural extension of that is that um, aromatic enrichment. The enrichment and the different aromas that you're exposed to in your environment also can impact your intelligence. Um, what they're even calling in this study cognitive resistance. Yeah. So there are people who um, who have the same sort of, uh, I guess, physical dysfunction in the brain leading to Alzheimer's, but they the scientists have discovered that with the same kind of physical impairment in the brain, some are actually have have no signs of Alzheimer's, and some are sort of experiencing significant cognitive impairment. And they've asked the question, well, what's the difference? And they've done studies and they've said, well, the more education that you have, the more resistance that your brain has, the more that you're trying new things and, and you know, playing games or doing puzzles, that gives your brain sort of what they call cognitive resistance. So even with the same physical characteristics, you can form new neural networks and, and overcome what uh, what nature is trying to do to you as you age. So uh, yeah. yeah, it's it's wonderful stuff. Yeah, so many opportunities there. So um, I don't want to I don't want to keep you too much longer. But I have one ever one other thread I'm curious for your take on. So Young Living is now 30 years old, and I know you didn't know Gary. I knew him a tiny bit, not like many of the great leaders in Young Living know him or knew him. But I'm, I'm curious what you think about our future as a network marketing company. Specifically, Mark, there is product customer acquisition. There's us telling our story and bringing new customers to the community. And then there is the opportunity to add to that conversation, really expressing the network marketing opportunity where if you look at how New Skin grew or how Amway grew or how Herbalife grew, or you really look at how Young Living grew, maybe accidentally, there's, there is really a recognition and an appreciation and an embracing of this model. It's no accident that Gary and Mary chose this particular model for us to heal the homes in the world. And there's a particular piece of it which is that, you know, anyone can become a distributor, brand partner, whatever we want to call them. And I can become a brand partner today and I can have you be a brand partner if you want to tomorrow or even an hour from now. And you can have a couple of friends be brand partners a couple hours from now or two days from now. And there's a, there is a concept there that is born in nature, right? whether it's in rabbits or lily pads, of the exponential growth concept in network marketing, which is how Amway is an eight and a half billion dollar company. It's not because they went out and got all these customers, it's because they also embraced, there's an economic opportunity here, and that motivates me to build a customer community and build a sales force and some of those people get inspired to build a sales force. And that's how we end up with 3 million distributors in Amway. 
So I'm asking you outside perhaps your area of expertise, but your area of acceptance and wisdom, what do you think about us taking better advantage of the model we're in as how we're going to get to be a $10 billion impact in the world? How are we going to grow? And yeah. how do you feel about embracing that network marketing opportunity to help us do that? Yeah, I think uh, sort of, as I shared with you earlier, you know, I recognized very early on, like 30 years ago, what a brilliant opportunity it is to be a force for good. And I guess for me, that's the key is that the network mo marketing model is, is a perfect thing. I mean, okay, they're always tweaking it and, you know, front end and back end and all of those things. And that's certainly not my expertise. But the, the idea that I have is, or where I see the strength is, is when you harness that network ability with a, a really important mission. And I really feel like that's why um, Gary and Mary chose this model, right? Because they knew how much, how far the reach could be and especially if you have a mission. So if, if your idea is just to sell products and make a profit, you know, uh, I'm sure there are a lot of companies that's, that are succeeding at that. But when you have a really defined mission and when you know what you're about and you really want to be a force for good in the world, you want to impact people's lives and their homes, like you said, heal the homes. I love that. That's one of the things I recognized when I first came here is what there's this um, sort of mind, spiritual sort of enrichment kind of component and there's a healthy homes component and uh, that's always been a part of this company it's been a part of that magic I think so where where does this need to go for the next 30 years I think um, you know there are companies that you would look at and say well they're catching up right I mean they've so they've caught on to the fact that essential oils are amazing and so they're making them and they're they're claiming to be better at what we're doing than we are ourselves and quite frankly I from what I've seen from a chemistry point of view and a quality point of view, I don't believe that. Certainly, I don't believe it from a farm's point of view and from sort of a bigger picture of regenerative agriculture and uh, seed to seal. I mean, the stuff that Young Living is doing is amazing. And that's why I'm actually kind of surprised that I hadn't heard of a lot of the stuff that Young Living is doing. So their whole culture, the whole uh, way that we approach oils and health and all of this is really quite distinct, quite amazing. Uh, it's unparalleled. So maybe the magic is, yeah, let's double down on this incredible direct selling model, but let's be less shy about uh, the amazing things that we're doing that people these days are really gaining an appreciation of, right? So yeah, I think we've got uh, certainly a really good foundation to uh, for this company to continue for the next 30 years. And that's my goal, definitely. Uh, part of it is to, I'm excited that I was invited to Young Living. We've got an amazing team here that I work with and we're training that next generation of, uh, you know, the, the corporation to do good R&D and to ask the right questions and to be structured the right way to support you guys, guys like you, Richard, and all of your teams so that you can really uh, just be so proud of what Young Living has and just give you the strength to go and uh, do that and be a force for good. I think you you hit on something there, Mark, that I would I just want to expand as I send people off from this interview that, um, you know, sometimes it's money and wealth and abundance that motivates people to go spread the word and, and create a team. And that's great. Money in the hands of the right people is a powerful force for good. But in almost all cases, the more important motive and maybe for those of you listening to this interview, you can think about if you find yourself avoiding or resisting or hiding from the opportunity to spread Young Living around the world, which starts with your network, your friends, your colleagues. And, and I know, because I've been doing this for 45 years, I know intimately what's going on right there is to have the courage to face rejection and ridicule and, and, and failure and maybe being seen as unpopular or desperate or there's that little psychology friction there that those of us that have been successful building teams and network marketing, we've figured out how to overcome that. 
And the secret, I believe, to overcoming it is you have to find a way to make the mission more important than the neuroses of, oh, I'm afraid of what people are going to think of me. Right. When, you, when the mission takes over your body and your spirit, you just you just go into a place of reckless abandon, right? You just, you forget about what people are going to think <laughs> and the mission overrides. And I think that's maybe an opportunity. We could all come together with your help, Mark, and we could get more focused on the mission and, and maybe more focused on what's keeping us as participants from loving that mission and embracing that mission and believing that mission so that we can overcome our own fears and our own procrastination and go share this idea with the world because somebody's going to be the next $10 billion educational, inspirational enterprise that changes lives and changes homes. And I believe yeah. it, it's us. But it's oh, going to yeah. be all of us getting into reckless abandon and passion with the mission in order to do that. And I'm yeah. so happy that you're on this team. There's something really special about you, Mark, really authentic and Thank real. You. And um, boy, it's kind of a sad that uh, you and Gary did not know each other because uh, we yeah. kindred spirits for sure. Yeah. I want to thank you on behalf of all of us, um, Mark, for being here and being the right person at the right, right time. Thank Crystal for having some groundedness in Young Living and some history and guide you here and your eight children and six grandchildren for giving up some of their time with you to, to be here to make this mission work. And I'm Thank sure you. in the chat, if you get a chance to look at the Facebook group, you'll see all kinds of gratitude for what you're doing and what you're going to do for Young Living. Awesome. Well, I'm so happy to be here. And thank you very much for uh, letting me share some of your time today. It's been wonderful. Yeah, thank you, Mark. And all of you out there in Facebook land, um, we'll give you an opportunity to share this um, once we get it edited. And uh, thank you for participating. Have an awesome week. I'll see you maybe in a few days, Mark. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you all.